Good morning. Today is Tuesday, May 17th, 2022. Nowhere in the Torah does the Torah say to blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. That might sound surprising, but it's true. There is no verse in the Torah that says, blow a shofar on Rosh Hashanah. In fact, the only day where the Torah says, blow a shofar, is on Yom Kippur. And not every Yom Kippur, only once every 50 years. And that mitzvah is in our Torah portion, the Shabbos, the Parsha Bahar. So first there's a mitzvah of Shemitah. That's a cycle of seven years. Six years we work the land. The seventh year we let the land rest. And then we count seven cycles of seven years. We count seven cycles of seven years. That brings us to the Shemitah year, which is year number 49 of this cycle. Then, Vahavarta Shofar Trua, Bachodesh Hashvi, Besor Lachodesh Biomakipurim, Taviru Shofar Bachal Arzachem. In the 50th year, that's going to be the Yovel year, the Jubilee year. And on the 10th day of Tishrei, on Yom Kippur, you blow a Shofar. And with that blowing of the shofar, we sanctify the 50th year. We proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a year of Yovel, Jubilee. And every person will return to their inheritance and will return to their family. So why do we blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah? If there is no verse in the Torah that says blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah, well, the Rambam explains there is a mitzvah to blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah because the Torah does say about Rosh Hashanah that Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Tishrei, the beginning of the Jewish year, is Yom Trua, a day of the Trua sound, which is the sound that the shofar makes. Now, from that verse alone, you don't know what you're supposed to do with the shofar. Maybe you're just supposed to look at it. However, the Rambam says, even though the Torah does not explicitly say to blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, but it says concerning Yovel, the Jubilee year, Vavater Shofar, Taviru Shofar, you should blow the shofar on the Yovel year, and therefore we derive from Yovel that we blow shofar every Rosh Hashanah. So it's it's very interesting. There is no verse that says blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. It's associated with the shofar, but the actual verse to blow the shofar, the source is from Yom Kippur, but only on the Yovel year, the Jubilee year. Now, I think we're all familiar with the themes of shofar that relate to Rosh Hashanah. Akedas Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac the process of teshuva, repentance, announcing Malchus, the sovereignty of God, announcing like a coronet, announcing the approach of the sovereign. We have all these ideas of how shofar connects to Rosh Hashanah. But why do we blow shofar on Yom Kippur? So the first point I want to clarify is that we blow shofar every year on Yom Kippur at the conclusion of Yom Kippur, at the end of Ne'ilah, after Ne'ilah is over. That's not the same thing as this mitzvah. The mitzvah in our parsha is only when there is a Yovel year, a Jubilee year, and that only occurred so far when it requires the base Amigdash is standing in Jerusalem, and it also requires that a majority of worldwide Jewry is living in Israel. 
even during the second temple period, there was no Yovel. There was Shemitah, the seven-year cycle, but the 50-year cycle did not apply even in the second temple period. It has not applied during our exile. Of course, we await that it will return soon, but it has not applied in a long, long time. So the mitzvah of blowing shofar on Yom Kippur only applies when Yovel is in effect, and that mitzvah, again, which is in our parsha, occurs during the day of Yom Kippur, even if it falls on Shabbos, which is not like Rosh Hashanah. And there is a bracha that is recited. Today, when we blow shofar at the end of Yom Kippur, after Ne'ilah, that's only a minhag, it's only a custom. It is a reminder of what, when there was Yovel, that on that Yom Kippur, the shofar would be blown. But we do it, again, as a, the, the mitzvah is not with us. So we do it as a reminder, as a custom. That's why we do it after Ne'ilah, when Yom Kippur is technically already over. We don't recite any bracha over it. The truth is, for us, we're not even allowed to blow a shofar on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is like Shabbos. We don't, we're not allowed to blow a shofar or any, play any musical instrument on Yom Kippur or Shabbos. So we have to wait until technically Yom Kippur is over and then we blow shofar as a custom, a reminder. But when it was a mitzvah, like our Parsha commands, on that Yom Kippur of Yovel, once every 50 years, why? Why was it a mitzvah? And why was it done on Yom Kippur? So, first, a piece of background. There is a subject, a term. The term is Eved Ivri. Now, that term is norm, often translated as a Jewish slave. That is an imprecise and misleading translation, notwithstanding that it's used so frequently. It's not a slave. It is a way for a person to work off a debt. In Jewish law, this is actually a very progressive system. It has a word that we, in English, we, it has a connotation that's very, very negative, but that's why it's inaccurate. This is a, a system that applied when the Jewish court system was in its complete application, where a person who found themselves in debt and they could not pay their debt, they didn't have the funds, they had the opportunity to be able to work off the debt. It's much better than the system we have today of bankruptcy, which causes all kinds of humiliation and other kinds of problems and difficulty with credit later on. It's certainly a whole lot better than what existed up until the late 1800s of debtor's prison to put someone in jail because they couldn't pay a debt. How counterproductive is that? How are you ever going to pay back a debt if you end up in jail? And there was a maximum term. No matter how much the debt was, if you worked for six years or until the next Yovel, whichever was sooner, you were automatically freed of any more debt. So the message of this structure, of this system, is that you have to work off your debt. You're responsible for your debt. You have to work it off. But there's a cap. There's a maximum. You get a second chance. And that second chance is a free start. You start over with no debts and no accumulated difficulties. Fresh start. This system interrupts the cycle of poverty. And in fact, it is a magnificent and progressive social system. It's not a bailout. It's not a handout. It's something really to be remarkably proud of once we understand how it actually works and get past the unfortunate translation of the term, which is inaccurate. Okay, that's background. When the Torah says about Yovel, ukrasem dror haaretz and proclaim liberty throughout the land, which is such a famous verse, it's written on the Liberty Bell of the United States. We all know that verse. What it's actually referring to, it's referring to the fact that all of the Evid Ivries at the time of the beginning of the Yovel year, they're going free. 
They're going home. Their term has ended. They are now going to start their new fresh start, their second chance. That's the liberty that we're talking about. But here's the question. Yovel is the Jewish year, this 50th year of the cycle. It starts on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Tishrei. So why is it that we blow the shofar on Yom Kippur, which is the 10th day of Tishrei? It's 10 days into the year. Why doesn't it start at the beginning of the Jewish year? So the Torah says, what is supposed to happen during those 10 days, it's the Yovel year. All of these people are supposed to go free to, to have their liberty back. Their term of service is over. What happens starting on Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year until Yom Kippur? The Torah says, this is later in the Torah, in Parsha of Re'e. When you, the employer, send your worker out because he or she has fulfilled their term, Los, Los I'm sorry, I lost my place. Los Don't send them away empty-handed. Hanek taniklo. Give them gifts. Mitzoncha, umigarncha, umiikvecha. Gifts from your flocks, from your crops, from your wine harvest, from what God has blessed you, you should share with them and give them gifts. So in these 10 days, they're still with you, these workers. They're not yet gone home, but they're not working. And it's a time of gift giving and celebrating and feasting together and celebrating the imminent liberty that they are about to enjoy starting on the 10th of, of Tishrei. So, the actual liberty occurs on the 10th of Tishrei. That's why we blow the shofar on Yom Kippur, to announce everyone goes home, everyone gets a second chance. And it's a signal the blowing of the shofar is the signal of starting fresh, a new chance in life. The past is settled. It's time to move forward. And that, of course, is the message of Yom Kippur, of kapara, of atonement, of forgiveness, a fresh start. But the question is, why do it this way? Why have these 10 intermediate days, why not just release on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the Jewish year, which is when the 50th year begins? So the Torah says something very strange. I read to you the first Pasuk, that you give gifts during these 10 days before the workers go home. The next Pasuk says as follows, the Zacharta, and you should remember, Ki eved hayisa be'eretz Mitzrayim. You were slaves in Egypt. Now, that was real slavery, not, you know, working off a debt. What's that got to do with anything? That's why God says, I'm commanding you this thing today. What's, what's that got to do with giving gifts to the slaves, to the workers? So I've shared with some of you before in a slightly different context, the incredible answer that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs provides. Let's go back to the story, the narrative of the Exodus from Egypt. Remember this detail. Just before they're about to leave Egypt, Moshe says to the Jewish people, go to each of your neighbors and ask them for gold and silver and valuables. And they give it to them. And the Jewish people leave with, with wealth, with objects, with possessions. Why in the world would Moshe have asked the Jewish people to, have told the Jewish people to ask for this? 
So there are a few different reasons, and I've given several in the past, but listen to what Rabbi Sack says. A Pasik that we've quoted recently several times. The Torah says, incredible Pasik, we need to remind ourselves of this verse. Lo sesa'ev mitzri, the Torah commands us not to hate the Egyptian. If anybody has the right to hate the Egyptian, it should be us. After all they did to us for hundreds of years, slavery and torture and persecution. And the Torah says, Lo tesayv mitzri. Rabbi Sachs explains, Because a people driven by hate cannot be free. Listen to what Rabbi Sachs writes. Had the people carried with them leaving Egypt, a burden of hatred and a desire for revenge, Moshe could have taken the Jewish people out of Egypt, but he would not have taken Egypt out of the Jewish people. They would still be there, bound by chains of anger as restricting as any metal. To be free, you have to let go of hate. That's the significance of the silver and gold taken from the Egyptians. The Torah says a verse, Vinitzaltem es Mitzrayim, which some translators understand as, and you shall plunder the Egyptians. But Rabbi Sachs quotes Beno Jacob, who translates it differently. You will save the Egyptians. What does it mean? You're going to save the Egyptians by taking their gold and silver. You're going to save the Egyptians from being the object of your anger and desire for revenge. And in fact, you're going to save yourselves from living with hate. So, the gifts that they took from their neighbors were intended to persuade them. It was not the Egyptians as a whole, only Paro and the leaders that were responsible for their enslavement. But they were told to leave so to speak, on good terms, having just received gifts to help them not feel hatred and anger, to let go. Says Rabbi Sachs, that means drawing a line over the resentments of the past. And that is why when a servant went free, his master had to give him gifts. This is not to compensate for the fact of the servitude. There's no way to give back the years spent in this kind of arrangement, but there is a way of ensuring that the parting is done with goodwill, with some symbolic compensation. The gifts allow the former servant to reach emotional closure, to feel that a new chapter is beginning, to leave without anger and a sense of humiliation. One who has received gifts finds it hard to hate. That's the mitzvah of Shofar on Yom Kippur. Now, we don't have it today. We pray that it will return soon. We have the reminder of this every year at the end of Yom Kippur after Ne'ilah. And we also remember it this week, this Shabbos, as we learn this Parsha and this mitzvah. That we all have a need for a fresh start to leave behind animosity, to leave behind hate, and that there is a purification that comes with forgiveness and atonement towards each other and even to God. And that's why the source for blowing the shofar is on a very specific Yom Kippur. My friends, I want to wish you a great day, and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.